Well, we are smack dab in the middle of a series on prayer. Um, I'll teach us to pray, and we're looking at the Lord's Prayer um, bit by bit and sort of taking it in, because we say it every week, and I don't think it always sinks in for us. Um, and I want to start by just sharing a little story about when I moved here. I moved to Seattle when I was eight years old. My mom had gotten accepted into the Masters of Nursing program at UW. So I moved up here at eight with my brother who is 13 and my other brother who is 15. So you have single mom, Masters of Nursing, three kids, two of them teenagers, and the worst one, the youngest, was a mess. Um, that's trouble. I was the worst of, of my siblings, for sure, the hardest. And um, I have no clue about how much resources any of this took. I just kind of took it for granted that there was always enough. And I couldn't understand why my mom would get so mad when I, like, lost my coat again. I had a, a way of leaving things wherever I put them down and never finding them again. Um, or when I would decide that I didn't really want to go to ski school, so that lift ticket, I just wasn't going to use it. Um, but we were, things were tight. Things were very tight. Um, and I had certain assumptions about money that now that I look back, um, about resources in general and, and provision, now that I look back, um, I think I probably would have acted differently if I realized them. And I found that as um, we dive into the, today's part of the Lord's Prayer, which is give us this day our daily bread, I found myself um, realizing that I had some assumptions about God and his provision and our, my relationship with him that needed to be challenged. And so I thought I would share some of those um, things that I think these words give us this day, our daily bread, um, challenges in our lives. Um, and the first is, it may seem like a no-brainer, but that there's not as big of a separation between the spiritual and the physical and the emotional um, as we sometimes like to think. Give us this day, our daily bread teaches us that God actually cares about every area of our life. He cares about the bread that we eat each day. He cares about our sustenance. And um, God does not compartmentalize our lives into spiritual, emotional, physical, and spiritual or uh, mental areas. It's not like he only cares about, well, I'm here for your spiritual life, but good luck on the rest on your own. Um, that is not how God sees us. He cares deeply about all of us. And that same speech in which the Lord's Prayer comes from, it's the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus um, says in Matthew 7, 7, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened up to you. And everyone who asks will receive. Everyone who seeks will find. And everyone who knocks, uh, the door will be opened. And I always thought that was pretty much about spiritual things. Like God's inviting us to seek him, and then he will show up if we knock, and if we seek, and if we ask for him to show up. Um, and then I read that text a little bit further, and it says, Which of you, who has a son who asks for some bread, would give him a stone? Which of you, who has a kid who asks for a fish, would give him a snake? Now, don't you think that if you're able to give good gifts, how much better can your father have? His examples were food, bread, fish, staples of people's lives. Um, they weren't just spiritual analogies. God cares. And he will watch out for us. He will care for us. And it's a strange thing that he asks us to pray. Give us to stay our daily bread. Um, it doesn't seem very uh, nice. I mean, it's, it's sort of like what I used to say to my mom, which was, Mom, what's for dinner? It, it wasn't, Mom, would you be so kind as to make dinner if you have the time? It wasn't. Mom, will there be dinner tonight, or should I fend for myself tonight? Um, it was sort of the assumption that like, mom's going to make dinner, because that's what moms do. Uh, and, and it's a very similar prayer to go, God, give us this day our daily bread. It's not, God, if you're willing, or, hey, God, if you happen to care, or have time, or whatever. And so it's an invitation to be bold, to ask God for what you need, and to trust that God will be there for you. It takes a tremendous amount of faith you know, to know that God's got you in the palm of his hand and he is watching out for you and he will, will, be, will be there for you. Sometimes that's easier to sort out than others, but 
We're invited to ask boldly, trusting. Um, the second assumption that I found challenged by this is it says our, our daily bread, and, and that is enough. Our daily bread is just what we need that day. My measure of how much is enough is incredibly skewed. I live in a country where I am told thousands of times a day, literally, that if I have a little bit more, I would be really, really happy. A few more things, the right things, if I have the boat, if I have the extra house, if I have the vacation home, well, then I will be satisfied and happy. There was a survey done in preparation of the State of the Union address. Um, and it found that 80% of Americans don't feel like they have enough to be comfortable. It's a very interesting fact considering the wealth of our country. 80% of Americans don't feel like they have enough. And 60% of Americans believe that if they made $6,000 more per year, that that would be enough for them to be comfortable. And it raised two questions for me. And the first is, whoever said comfortable was the goal? It seems like a strange goal. It's a, um, it's a very selfish, self involved goal. In the last two weeks, we looked at thy kingdom come and thy will be done. I don't know if Jesus had the goal of self-comfort. He had a goal of seeing God's kingdom and influence happen in the world. What would it take for us to do that? Um, the second thing that it got me the question asking is, if those folks had six K more, would it be enough? Not sure it would be. I think if they got the six thousand dollars more a year, they would find that they just needed six thousand dollars more, and then they would be comfortable. <laughs> Maybe the power of more is actually a little overrated. I have been in ministry now for twenty years. Um, I have worked at a variety of pay scales, as low as you can imagine, and um, I've also lived in abundance. And I have gotten the opportunity to talk to a lot of people over those 20 years. And I have a working theory. You can decide that I'm absolutely full of it and I'm not right on this theory. But my working theory right now is that scarcity and abundance is actually a state of mind. Unless you have a ridiculous amount or ridiculously too little. I am not downplaying poverty at all. If you are in financial crisis, it is incredibly stressful and ruthless and brutal. Um, it is not a state of mind. But um, a lot of times we can think that we're in scarcity when we're not. And we get scarcity in other ways. Maybe it's scarcity of time or scarcity of quiet or scarcity of community. And I believe that God wants to meet us in those places and satisfy us. I think God actually wants us to have a life where we're so well taken care of that he has given us his love and his purpose, surrounded us by a community of faith, and given us his security to the point where we go, man, what I have is enough. And to me, the power of enough sounds a whole lot better than the power of a little bit more. I would way rather live in enough. Give us this day our daily bread isn't just a chance to ask God boldly for what we need. Um, it's a chance to release knowing how much that is and to say, God, I trust what you're going to give me this day will be enough for me. And then let God tell you what is enough. I love um, Proverbs 30, 8, 9. Um, i got to read it for you. Thanks, Larry. Keep popping me into scriptures in the Proverbs like you know. Oh, um, Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I might have too much and disown you and say, well, who is the Lord? Or I might become poor and steal and so dishonor and me. I think when we are in scarcity of any resource, sometimes it's because we don't ask. We don't have because we don't ask. But also, um, we sometimes think that it's on us to solve our problems. I don't know if you're anything like me, but I have a tendency to go, what can I do about this first? And then maybe I'll ask God when I realize that I can't handle this. And if we do so, I think we end up cutting corners or making compromises or making choices um, 
that question our integrity and then we end up dishonoring God in the process because we left him out of it. And then in abundance, um, we already have it, so we're not desperate. So why would we ask God for it? And then why do we even bother with this line in the Lord's Prayer? Give us this day our daily bread. We've already got that. We don't need you for much of anything. Um, and that would be to disown the Lord. <laughs> in First Chronicles, um, the main thing that's happening in First Chronicles is the building of the temple is happening. So David doesn't get to build the temple. He really, really wants to after Israel is established. And um, his son does, Solomon. But David kicks it off by taking an offering and saying, all right, people, we're going to build an amazing, beautiful building. Here's the stuff we're going to need to do this. Um, and in 1 Chronicles, it's 29. That's where I'm going. 1 Chronicles 29. David takes this offering and it says that the people rejoiced at the willing response of their leaders, for they had given freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord. And David and the king also rejoiced. And then David prays, prays this prayer. Praise be to you, Lord, the God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Wealth and honor come from you, and you are the ruler of all things. And in your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks. We praise your glorious name. But who am I? Who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you. And we've given you only what comes from your hand. We're foreigners and strangers in your sight. We are... We were, as, we, as were all of our ancestors. Our days on earth are like a shadow without hope. Lord, our God, all this abundance that we have provided for building you a temple for your name comes from your hand, and all of it belongs to you. That's a crazy idea. Everything in the world belongs to God. All of it comes from him. And it absolutely creates a paradigm shift in our brains because instead of it being all about what we can do for God, suddenly it becomes what God has done for us and we give a tiny bit back. What a generous, generous God we serve. And then it stops being about God demanding so much from us, but rather leaving so much of what he's given us to our own use. It allows us to be generous. And that is the power, I think, of enough. When we live in a place going, I have enough because God is there with me, providing for me. It allows us to be generous when we have too much. And in scarcity, it puts us into a place to say, I trust that God will show up here. When I don't have the words, when I don't have the resources, when I don't know what it is that I am going to say or do, when I'm trying to do this for the Lord, I trust that he will show up. One more um, assumption I want to get at, and that, that I felt challenged in, and that, that is that um, I know what I need, and that when God doesn't give it, um, somehow he messed up. He didn't do enough. He failed me. Imagine if, when I was a little kid, eight years old, I moved up here with my mom, and, uh, and then I go to my mom and I go, hey mom, not what's for dinner, but I've decided I really want mac and cheese for the rest of this week. Um, I've also decided that we are not going to have veggies anymore. They don't really taste good. And um, while you're at it, skip the bedtime. We're not doing that anymore either. Um, actually, that's remarkably similar to how I lived my youth. It didn't work out well for me. But, um, <laughs> But had it, if my mom said, okay, I'll just give you mac and cheese. You don't need to sleep. Just play video games all night. It'll be good. Um, that's so horrible for me. Give us this day our daily bread as an opportunity to say, Lord, you're the chef. You provide the meal. Um, and I think you're going to give me what's best. Christina and I got to celebrate an anniversary in Vancouver, B.C. We went up uh, there and, and we went to 
this restaurant that we had heard really good things about that was near the hotel we were staying. And we went in, and it was weird. They didn't hand us a menu. They said, do you want the three course or the seven course meal? Hmm, <laughs> three sounds like a lot, so seven must be ridiculous. We better stick with three, I guess. And then they put us at a table. And they had us pick out our drinks. And that was it. And in this restaurant, the chef goes to the farmer's market, sees what he can find, goes to the fishmonger, sees what he can find. And then based on what he found that day that looks the best that he knows how to make really well, he decides some stuff to make for you. Um, Christina and I do not like mushrooms. It's not that we're allergic to them. They asked us about allergies. We couldn't claim mushrooms as an allergy in true honest form. But we just don't like them. And sure enough, the first dish that comes out is a mushroom dish. <laughs> this whole idea is going horribly. It's our anniversary, for goodness sakes. That was the best mushroom dish I have ever had. If mushrooms tasted like that, I might have tried them sooner. But they don't normally taste like that, and they haven't tasted like that since. <laughs> but the guy knew how to make them. He knew what was best that day. When we pray, Lord, give us this day our daily bread, we let him decide the menu. And we might not like what comes to us that day, but we trust God that he gives us what we need. In Luke 22, um, verses 41 through 43, Jesus is uh, getting ready for the cross. He is praying with his father. He's actually pleading with him. He doesn't, he doesn't want to go to the cross in this moment. I want to read it for you. Uh, Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. And on reaching that place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. Then he withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them. He knelt down and he prayed, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. And then an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. Um, Jesus makes it abundantly clear what he wants. And as should we. we go to the Lord and say, Lord, I want, I need this. But God doesn't take the cup from him. And thank goodness that he did, or else we would not be saved. We would be lost. Instead, what he did was he gave him something that he hadn't asked for. An angel sent to strengthen him. <clears throat> and that is the incredible tension of asking God, as we ask God for what we want and what we need, and then we trust that God gives us what it is that we actually need.